let's continue from last week. We drew this Kikuchi band pattern showing the symmetry. And you can see the very center. The very center we call it is a pole. So let's call this is, it's a pole. And specifically, this is a, a one pole. Then what happens if we rotate the crystal in real space? What's going to happen to the uh, to the Kikuchi bands? Assume we rotate the crystal like this, and what's going to happen to the pole as well as all the other bands is they will move up, following the Kikuchi band. Then what if we rotate? that along another axis like this, rotate in this way by 10, 20 degrees, then what's gonna happen is we'll have the 001 pole moving here. That's how you can get various orientations from EBSD, how you capture the differences in uh, orientations using EBSD. All we have here so far, that's just raw data. Then how does computer know the, uh, the orientation of the crystal based on the Kikuchi pattern information? So mathematically, what the computer does is something called Hopf transformation. What Hoff transformation does is to convert line information into points. Let's look at one example and very quickly uh, you will learn why we need to do that. Assume this is the coordinate we have here. We have X and Y and we have a straight line we have a straight line, kind of like that. You can easily write that as like y equals to ax plus b. That's the most common form in the Cartesian coordinates. You can also view that differently. Any line you draw in the space can be defined by another two parameters, not only a and b. What the other two parameters? The first is if we draw a normal, draw a line normal to, to this line, we have angle theta here. That's one thing. The second thing is we know the distance from the origin to where the normal intersects with the other line. So we denote that as rho. So the straight line here can also be defined as theta and the row. I hope that is clear. Okay, now let's go back to the uh, Kikuchi line. Assume this is the uh, pattern you see. That's the screen and uh, Let's have something like this. This will be the origin. Okay. Assume we have two bands. We have one band like this, another band like this. To simplify the uh, the problem, let's only look at the uh, the line that's close, that's that, that that is closer to the origin. So for line one, oops, for line one, let's just say this is line one, and let's say this is line two. For line one, we have let's draw a normal, the normal to the line. We have theta one and r one. Sorry, row one. Okay, for line two, let's draw the normal again. That's 90 degrees. We have theta two and row two. 
Now let's plot these two lines in a different coordinate. So what we have here, we have the x axis as theta, y axis as rho. So for the first line you see here, theta one, like since it's going clockwise, it will be somewhere negative. So actually, let me see. Yeah, let me reposition that. Okay, theta one, we can count that as negative. So it will be somewhere here. And row one is positive. So we have one point here to define theta one and the row one. So this will be line one. And for the second line, theta two is positive. So it's somewhere here. And it's about the same roughly about the same angle as theta two. Let's assume they are the same. So we'll have somewhere theta two here, but row one is greater than row two, just by visual inspection. Then we have the point two here. You can see by using Hopf transformation, you kind of reduce the dimension. You, 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 you reduce lines into points. Does this make sense? <laughs> okay. Then in diffraction pattern, in the Kikuchi uh, diffraction pattern or Kikuchi diffraction bands in the, in, the, in the raw data, there are many, many, many bands here. Then the computer, what the computer does after doing half transformation, instead of seeing the lines, they will see points. The reason why the computer does that is it is difficult for computer to compare lines to do pattern recognition or pattern matching. It's much easier for computers to do point pattern matching. Then what we acquired here from the half transformed data, then this data will be compared to the database. And it will give you two sets of information. The first set is by looking at the symmetry of how these points lay out, you will get the crystal structure information. And also looking at how close the zone is at the, uh, on the screen, whether it's at the center or off the center, it will tell you the crystal orientation. This is what the computer does after seeing those bands in your experiments. Now we can map or we can match the half transformed patterns, those dots to the ones created in the database then what's the next one? The next thing to do is to calculate the misorientation angle to a given reference point. So the next step to do is orientation determination. In EBSD, there's no translation. There's only rotation. So let's look at the uh, rotation in 3D. We have x axis, we have y axis, and we have z axis here. If you rotate something along the x axis, it's called angle phi. And if you rotate along the y axis, it is called, it is called 
psi, like the ones you see in wave functions, then if you rotate around the axis, that's theta. Just imagine like any direction, you start from something like this in 3D, and now it's somewhere here. It's the same magnitude. So that's start, this is end. The magnitude of the direction will not change. The only thing happens is rotation. Doesn't matter like where you draw the new vector, this position can be achieved by rotating around x, around y, and around z. So any rotation can be described by these three rotation angles. If we write down the, uh, the rotation matrix, so this is the rotation matrix, it will be rotation x psi, then cross rotation y phi, and cross rotation z theta. And this is the rotation matrix. In linear algebra, you learned, you learned when you do matrix multiplication, the matrix itself is an operator. What you do is you have a system, you apply a linear transformation to the system. You can stretch it, you can share it, and okay, also you can do rotation. What we do here is we use the rotation matrix. It's a three by three matrix. To achieve the rotation. So this is R11, R12, R13, R21, R22, R23, then 31, 32, and 33. Then how to write these entries, these R's, in terms of theta, phi, and psi. You'll see that in the, in the slides. But the takeaway message is any rotation you do in 3D, it can be described by rotating along the x-axis, then y-axis, then z-axis. And these angles, they have a special name. These are called Euler angles. And in EBSD, for each pixel, for each pixel, when you throw away the raw data, if you only focus on the orientation, what, this, what the information left behind is the Euler angles. That's the information you have for orientation mapping. And Euler angles tells you the crystal orientation. So this is all the theory part of EBSD. Any questions? All clear? Okay. Let's just quickly look at the, uh, the setup. You've seen that in the lab last week, so we can draw that as well. So EBSD experimental setup. We learned we need to use the, uh, the pre till holder. So this is your sample. And You tilt that by 70 degrees, or the pre tilt holder will tilt the sample by 70 degrees. And here comes the detector. When the electron hits the material, then the backscattered electrons will hit the detector. That's why EBSD is electron backscatter di uh, diffraction. That's the setup of, of EBSD. I want to quickly introduce you a new technique. Um, we didn't really do it in the demo, but it exists. The technique is called TKD. So, 
it's very similar to eBSD, very similar. And it has certain advantages. So it's called transmission. Kikuchi. Diffraction. And it's called TKD. What it does is the, the, um, the, 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 the principle is very simple, very similar to EBSD. Um, but instead of tilting the sample by 70 degrees, you have the sample being flat. But the sample has to be very thin, usually 100 nanometers in thickness. Then you position the sample above the detector. So this is your EBSD detector. So EBSD detector. We have the electron beam hitting, uh, hitting the specimen. In this case, instead of using the back scattered electrons to form the diffraction, it used the forward scattered electrons to form the diffraction pattern. So this is backscattered. And these are forward scattered. So is this technique similar to TEM? Because uh, are, are the electrons are transmitted? Exactly, yeah, you're right, TEM stands for that's something actually I was going to ask you guys. Uh, you, you asked a really good question. Um, TEM stands for transmission electron microscopy. So in this case, in TKD, it's very, very similar to TEM. It's very similar to TEM. But, but in TEM, you capture images. You capture the, uh, the uh, like, um, kind of like you are looking at a shadow. If you have like a glass, uh, if, if you have a bubble, or if, if you have a bug, encapsulated in a, in a slice of glass, then you put it on the light, cast a shadow, that's what we see. Here, that is what TEM regular imaging works. Um, here we have the, uh, uh, the specimen very thin, but underneath, instead of collecting the image of the material, we collect the Kikuchi pattern, the diffraction information of the material. So you're right, it's very similar to TEM. Actually, I was going to ask, Ask, like what is <laughs> what is the similarity and the difference of this technique and the TEM? Since you asked me, so I, I gave you the the answer. Does, does this address your question? Oh yes, thank you. Okay, cool. So this technique is very similar to uh, to TEM, but uh, in TEM, you in many cases, like in addition to diffraction, you can also do regular imaging. Um, in TKD. The, tr the transmission Kikuchi diffraction is a diffraction technique. So you get the, uh, the diffraction information. Okay. Um, this is all I like to talk about regarding EBSD. Let's look at the, uh, the slides. All right. In this lecture, we covered two topics, ECI, that's electron channeling contrast imaging, and EBSD, electron backscattered diffraction. Let's look at the, uh, the setup of ECI and EBSD. We discussed more on the setup of EBSD. We said 70 degrees like tilting and uh, we captured the backscattered electron diffraction information on the detector. For ECI, uh, what you do is it's very similar to regular SEM imaging. You lay the sample flat, but the sample surface has to be really good. Then you put the, uh, the sample in, raise the stage, bring the sample close to the detector then acquire information. So that's ECI setup versus the EBSD setup. For ECI, you didn't see too many examples uh, in the lab. Um, these are some really nice micrographs uh, from taken using ECI. Uh, Professor Dirk Rabe, who is the director at the Max Planck Institute in Dusseldorf, his group pioneers in, in this technique. So these images, they appear like TEM images, but they are actually SEM images. You can see individual dislocations using SEM, using ECI. 
you can see stacking pulse. These are stacking pulse. You can see dislocation cell structures. And you can see nano twins as well as dislocations within the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the microstructure. So all these information, they used to be something you can only uncover using TEM. Now using Aki, you can do that. But when doing Aki, you, you have less control. It's basically um, depends on how lucky you are. Maybe the first grain you do imaging, you can get really nice microstructural information, or maybe you look at 100 grains because they're not at the right orientation condition, uh, you won't get any information. So it's, it's a low cost, but you have, it, it's a low cost technique, but you have less control. Um, this is the work done by Griffin. Griffin is a student in our group, uh, working with uh, Brady and James at the Army Research Lab. The sample you're looking at here is a cold spray tungsten. There are two things you can see straight away. Not tungsten by that, it's tantalum, cold spray tantalum. There are two uh, distinct microstructural features you can, you can see here. The first is the grain size is bimodal. Some of the grains are large. Some of, some of the grains are super small. So we, we, have a di we have a bimodal grain size distribution. The second thing is really from Aki. The image was taken using the uh, uh, backscattered detector. Um, for some of the large grains, you can see a lot of strain information. You can see a lot of strain information in the material. This is because during cold spray process, um, it happens so fast, there's a lot of deformation happening to the particle when it is getting deposited. And this level of strain is stored in the, in the microstructure and it was revealed by the, uh, by the active technique. Okay, to EBSD. Just to recap how EBSD works. In EBSD, I hope you still remember, it's a two-step process. The first step is electron beam hits the, uh, the specimen. It will undergo incoherent scattering. So the scattering is going in all directions. Then after that, only, only the electron beam, only the electrons that can be bracked, diffracted, they will form the Kikuchi line or the Kikuchi band. Okay? In, uh, what you saw just now is what happens in 2D. In real life, in 3D, this is what happens. Um, the Kikuchi lines you see here, all those are actually 3D crossover cones projecting on the 2D detector. So this is a crossover cone. And because of this specific orientation, it gives you like a flat band flat line on the EBSD detector. Okay, and this is just one example of uh, uh, Kikuchi pattern you see from single crystal silicon. Um, this is something we call stereographic projection. Maybe it's really confusing, but based on this, you can kind of tell the, let, let me go back, coming back here. If we focus at that hole here, this pose moving around. So what this tells you is as you rotate the crystal around, the pose you see will move around as well. In stereographic projection, the straight lines will eventually become arcs. Unless you are at the equator or you are like, you know, going straight up and down. But in EBSD, we're looking at something so local. That's why even the the position of the pole is not at the right center, it's not right at the other center. Um, the lines, they still appear to be straight. And I hope this will give you um, another way of seeing how crystals rotate and uh, the, uh, EB, uh, the EBSD pattern, the uh, QG pattern will ro rotate accordingly. From this information, you back, back calculate the uh, orientation information. Okay, the, in, in this slide, it shows you like how to use computer imaging, image processing um, to enhance the, uh, the, the contrast. In many cases, the raw data, um, EBSP, like uh, that's diffraction pattern, um, is pretty faint. Then by doing the background subtraction, the background division, all these kind of imaging 
image, uh, image, image processing techniques, you can highlight the people's events in the material to make the analysis much easier. Okay, um, this slide summarizes how the computer does the, uh, the data analysis. It, it will look at one pixel, and this is the raw data you are getting. Then the computer will convert that into points using Hopf transformation. That's what we covered at the beginning of today's class. Then they will do the, uh, the pattern matching based on the Hopf transformation and create the Kikuchi lines from the calculation, overlay that on the experiments to see whether it's, a, it's a, like to, to help you, like uh, to help the, the users visually tell whether it's a good match or not. After that, it will give us the crystal orientation. And this is the pole figure telling us like the 001 um, planes in the, uh, in the pole figure. But um, in your case, you can just focus on here. Uh, this tells us it's very close to the 111 zone axis with this grain. What else I have? Okay, we also have the rotational matrix. Um, we only drew like phi, psi, and the theta, um, like, you know, in the, uh, uh, on the paper. Here, it breaks down the rotation matrix in to details into individual components. So you can write R11, R12, R13, etc. as theta, phi, and the psi. So this is the rotation matrix. Um, the the ro rotation, rotational matrix is not only useful for image processing, also think about your, your playing game. For example, you play uh, uh, League of Legends, for example. Then you have characters. You, you, your, your character moves around in the forest or on the map. You run, sometimes you run in the north direction, sometimes you run east. Then all the rotation in the computer are achieved by this rotational matrix on the 3D model. Hopefully you learned something interesting, but maybe not that useful. <laughs> okay, um, let's look at the, uh, the merits and the limitation of EBSD. On the left, that's one example uh, I acquired uh, when I was at Hopkins. Uh, the sample is um, like a, a, a SPS, a sintered or consolidated boron carbide. In EBSD, you can easily get the crystal orientation information by looking at the, the color, you know, the crystal orientation. Also, you can get the texture information, whether there's a preferred growth direction or preferred texture in the material. If all the grains you see here, they have more or less the red color or more or less blue color, then you know the sample is highly textured. In this case, it's quite colorful and uh, the color seems to be quite random. We can tell there's no strong texture in the material. You can also do face identification by looking at the symmetry of the Kikuchi lines. You can tell whether it's FCC, BCC, or ATCP. A classical example is the duplex steel. Steel can be FCC, can be BCC. In duplex steels, uh, both FCC and uh, BCC faces are present in the material. So when, when, when you run EBSD, you can tell like where the FCC face is at and where the BCC face is at. You can also easily measure the grain size. You can look at the grain morphology, whether the grains are elongated or uh, acquiesced. You can also look at the grain boundary characteristics. In this example, all the regular grain boundaries, they are marked in dark lines. The twin boundaries, they are highlighted by red color. So all the red lines you see here, those are twin boundaries. And most importantly, they are pretty. As a microscopist, uh, we always look for things are, are pretty. Okay. However, there are limitations. The first limitation is sample preparation. Um, any group, like uh, if you do metals, if you do ceramics, uh, if you have group members, you have students or postdocs uh, in the group working on EBSD, um, just ask them. They, they know how difficult, how challenging to do the sample prep, especially before the the uh, invention of ion mill. Uh, nowadays, you can do really nice polishing, then do ion milling to get really good surface. But before the advent of ion, ion mill, uh, sample prep has been extremely challenging. The second limitation is something more intrinsic. It has limited spatial resolution. That's something we covered a few weeks ago when we discussed electron beam material interaction. We're looking at the diffraction from the backscattered electrons. And doesn't matter how fine you tune the electron beam, 
once it enters the material, it will scatter. And the interaction volume is way larger than the beam size. That's why for EBSD, the standard or the, 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 the best resolution you can achieve is 20 to 50 nanometers. You cannot go any, anything smaller than that using conventional EBSD. However, using TEM, inside TEM, since we are looking at forward scattered electrons, we don't have a huge amount of material to interact with the electrons. We do have some broadening, but the broadening is much better. It's much more limited. So in regular TEM, the spatial resolution is straight to five nanometers. Coming back to TKD, in TKD, we also use the transmission method. Like we, we also use the, uh, um, well, we also use the transmitted beam, the forward scattered beam to, uh, to, to tell us the crystal orientation information. That's why, that's why in, the, uh, in TKD, you can get better spatial resolution than EBSD, but you need to prepare samples like TEM samples. Okay, this is a summary of factors affecting the diffraction pattern um, quality. I will not go through all the details, but uh, um, you have the slides. This is more for you, like as a reference. Okay, a few fun slides. The first is the, uh, uh, the use of half transformation. Half transformation, you can use that not only in EBSD, you can use that for many, many other applications. Um, I took the image from like uh, internet. Here, you see a building. Buildings, like, you know, from the construction, you see a lot of lines straight lines here. By doing half transformation, it will identify all the lines. All these lines will, will form like points in the half map. And if you only use those points to plot, to back plot the image, you'll get something like this, something really nice. And also for your project, if there's a need to find, quickly find many lines in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an image or in a micrograph, half transformation is one of the ways you can, you can do that. And also we discussed Euler angle. So uh, 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 just some fun facts about Euler. Euler was born in Switzerland, but he died in Russia because uh, Peter the Great, uh, he liked him very much and invited him to, to live in Russia. He's also uh, a, very good, a very close friend with the Bernoulli's. Uh, if you have uh, taken physics or fluid mechanics, you know Bernoulli's equation. Uh, his thesis was on propagation of sound, and also he's a foreign member of AAAS in the United States. We're more familiar, um, in terms of Euler, we're more familiar with the, the Euler angle or Euler equation. Um, today, you learned something new about Euler, something called Euler angles. Another thing Euler proposed is the Konigsberg seven bridge problem. I'll pause on this slide for a little while and uh, um, to see whether you can find a solution for that. So the city Konigsberg is divided or segmented by a few rivers and there are seven bridges constructed across these rivers. Let's have a look. Can you visit all parts of the city but only cross each bridge once. I'll give one example. So starting from here, you can go like this, 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 then coming back to here. I'm not able to cross this bridge. Then have a look, give a try. Can you find a way to visit all parts of the city and cross all the bridges only once. The quick answer is no. Uh, this actually gave birth to a new branch of mathematics called topology. So uh, some fun facts about Euler, a genius. Okay, let me have a look at the, uh, the time. We still have 10 more minutes. Let's um, look at focus ion beam. Uh, before, before we go to uh, the new uh, 
topic, any questions about EBSD, about Aki? For people who work on metals and ceramics, it's more relevant. For people who work on nanoparticles, on polymers, uh, these two techniques are not really useful. Okay, we're gonna start a new topic. So lecture 10. Focused ion beam. Also from this lecture, we start a new, um, kind of like a new um, chunk of the, uh, the class. Um, this part, a new part of the class, this part is the SEM related techniques. They're not really SEM, but a lot of things you learned from SEM, you can translate, you can directly translate to this. Okay, so for fo focus down beam, let's start by looking at the source. We have the ion gun. In SEM, we have the electron gun. In FIP, we have the, uh, the ion gun. So you see the similarity and you will see the difference very soon. So what happens here is it is a liquid metal ion source. And what people usually use is gallium. The reason is because gallium the melting temperature is so low, you heat up that slightly, it will turn into a liquid. And this is the construction of the, uh, of the gun. You have a super, super thin needle here, okay? And uh, inside this chamber, you have the gallium reservoir. So this is gallium. It's everywhere. Since the opening is so thin, so what you have is you have some gallium coming out and getting coated to the, uh, to the needle. So this is the wetted liquid meniscus. And when you apply a voltage to that source, gallium ions can be ejected. So it's somewhat similar to the fuel emission gun, somewhat similar, but working in the different um, principle. Okay, let's look at the uh, um, lens system. We have the source on the very top. So we have the ion gun instead of the electron gun. So this is the ion source. Actually, when you use FIP, the first thing you're gonna do is you turn on the system to heat the source, to turn the solid gallium into li liquid gallium. Usually that takes a few minutes, okay? And after that, we have the lens system. So similarly, you have the condenser lens. And you have the objective lens. And not surprisingly, you have the scanning coil, but scanning coil has a different name in FIB. So it's called octopole. Due to the configuration, you have eight like plates to, to, to do that, to, to deflect the ion beam, octopole. This is for scanning. The reason why we cannot use a regular scanning coil as well, we'll discuss the lens in a little bit, is because the ions are much, much, much heavier than electrons. So you cannot use electromagnetic lens, you have to use something different. So the lenses we use here, those are electrostatic lenses.
similarly, like you cannot use the uh, scanning coil to, to deflect the, uh, the ion beam. You have to use something much stronger, which is also um, electrostatic plates to do that. Okay. So I hope you see the similarity. In SEM, it's pretty much the same. So if we draw that, so pretty much the same. Okay. Now let's look at FIB in SEM. Let's start by drawing the uh, schematic of the setup. On top, we have the electron source. So the electron will come down like this. And you have, for example, your specimen here. And the FIB, the ion gun, the ion source comes in at an angle. So this is electron source. This is ion source. In this specific configuration, we call the specimen is at the eccentric height. You'll see why. Or at the coincidence point. At the eccentric height. Or at the coincident in this case in this specific configuration if i want to tilt the specimen this is the new configuration of the specimen i tilt the specimen towards the ion source we are still looking at the same point That's why it is called at the eccentric height. Got to write T here. Or at the coincident point. Coincident basically means both the, electron, both, both the electrons and the ions, they are hitting the, uh, the same area. Do the ions and the electrons interact with each other because it's positively and negatively charged? Exactly. That's why you never turn them on at the same time. <laughs> okay. You only turn one, uh, one source on at a time. That's a very good question. That, 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 that's a very good comment as well. Yes. <laughs> very good. Very good. Any other questions? Okay. Now let's imagine a scenario. Let's lower the sample down to here. In this case, the electron will still look at this bit of the specimen. But the ion source, if you turn that on, it's not even looking at the, uh, the specimen. When you tilt the other uh, specimen, it will more tilt kind of like, like in this way. Instead of, it's too bad, like I, can't, I cannot show that to you in person. I'll do that in the, uh, in the lab session today. Instead of tilting just around that point here, in many of the cases, you, you want to do fibbing, focus ion beam, and imaging in the same area. That's why you have to bring the sample to the eccentric point. Sorry, you have to bring the sample to the eccentric height um, at the coincident point. And the fib is usually mounted about 55 degrees. Depends on the, uh, the, the, the company, the manufacturing company. So, it's about 55 degrees. So what this tells you is if you tilt the sample by 55 degrees, then the sample will be facing the ion source. If you tilt it back to zero degree, then it will face the electron source. Okay. So this is the configuration or setup of FIB inside SEM. Let's quickly look at the ion beam material interaction. You can see once you know SEM really well, you know how electron beam interacts with materials, uh, what signals you can generate. 
other techniques, you can use the same logic, you can use the same way to do the analysis and the learning. So ion beam. material interaction. Let's just do a recap on the electron beam material interaction. You should know that by heart now. Okay. So when we have electron source hitting the material, let me ask you, um, so that's the interaction volume. Um, let me ask you, what are the signals you can generate? You should know this very well by now. Any volunteers? <laughs> okay, all right. Electron. Excellent, so SE, what else do you have? Backscattering electron. Excellent, BSE. X-ray. And X-ray, excellent. Photons. And yep. Electric. Yeah, very good. Then these are the three major things. We also have photons. Cathodic uh, luminescence, so photons. Depending on what kind of electrons you have excited, whether those are like uh, in the outer shell or inner shell, then you have OJ electrons. Okay, OJ. So this is what signals you can generate from SEM, then the shaded area is in, uh, the interaction volume. Now, assuming this is 30 keV of electrons. Now let's look at ions. Very similar, very similar. You will have SE knocked out. Are you going to have BSE? are you going to have backscattered electrons when you shine um, ion beam on the specimen? It's tricky, any guesses? Yes, no, do you have BSE? Again, let's assume that's 30 kV. If you have PSC, why? If you do not have PSC, why not? Any guesses? Isn't the size of the ions gonna be a problem? Very good, very good. You, you, you just said something really, really important. The interaction volume is much smaller. So the interaction volume, like in SEM, is up to two microns. Um, for the ion beam, it's 10 to 20 nanometers. This is because the ions are way, way, way bigger than electrons and they can be readily stopped by the material. Okay, very good, very good. You said something I was going to say later. Very good. So the size matters here. Okay, did, back did you to spend, my- uh, 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 millimeters or nanometers? Nanometers, 10 to 20 nanometers. Let, let me write that more clearly, sorry. Okay, uh, but back to my um, original question. Do you see BSE or you don't see BSE? But let me ask you something easier. Do you see X-ray or you don't see X-ray? I should, put in, uh, I should put it in the final exam. <laughs> Do you see X-ray or you don't see X-ray? Uh, the answer is yes. The reason why you see X-ray is because you generate secondary electrons. When you generate secondary electrons, some of the secondary electrons can be from the core shell. If the core shell electrons are knocked out, then outer shell electrons will jump in to fill the hole and the excess amount of energy will be emitted as X-ray. So you will see X-ray. But are you going to see BSE? Are 
I'll give you the answer. The answer is no. Um, BSE is primary electron. In this case, we're not even throwing in electrons. So we cannot have the same electrons coming out. So no BSE. Uh, remember, BSEs are primary electrons. It's kind of like um, you going from home to work. You drive from home, then you drive back home. That's kind of like BSE. Secondary electrons are the, 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 the stuff you picked up from your office. It's kind of like you um, drive an empty car uh, to school then you find some books really interesting, then you bring some books along with you back home. Mm. So is there a possibility that we get an iron oxidized to lose an electron? Uh, the ion is already in the charged state. Uh, it will unlikely lose more electrons. Rather, uh, it may gain electrons to form atoms. But that's a very, very good way of thinking. That's a very good way of thinking. Um, what we have is already like plus, like um, the, 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 the valence shell electrons have been stripped away. It's already at a, uh, uh, I wouldn't say stable configuration, but it's, it's, it's more difficult to lose electrons. Um, in ion material interaction, you don't see BSE, but you will have backscattered ions. Some ions can bounce back. And also, since you are using, you are using ion, which is really strong, really with, with very high energy to blast the other material, it can mill a, a material away, then you'll have atoms from the material coming out as well. It's kind of like using, SE, uh, using SEM, you have a brick wall, then you throw ping pong balls or tennis balls at the, uh, the, the brick wall, then you have those ping pong balls, tennis balls bouncing back. In the, uh, the, uh, the, the um, ion beam material interaction, what you have is you're, you're not throwing like tennis balls, ping pong balls to the brick wall anymore. Assume, assuming you're super, super strong, you are throwing like rocks at the brick wall, then um, it, will, it will eventually break the brick wall. Every time the, the, the rock hits the brick wall, it will chip off some material. This is the working principle of FIB, how we use iron to cut the materials. So in iron being material interaction, you will still get secondary electrons. You will still get X-ray, but, but you will not get BSE. Some of the ions you throw in will be embedded in the material. Some of the ions will bounce back. At the same time, at the same time, some of the materials will come off as well. You will see that more in details in, in the lab today. And next week, when we come back to that, we'll re-emphasize this. We'll write down the signals or the information we can get from ion beam material interaction, then I'll leave it to you to think about the similarities and the differences when we compare electron beam material interaction and ion beam material interaction. Before we wrap up, any questions about FIB, focus ion beam? We covered the source, like the liquid metal source, we covered the lens system. It's nearly identical um, to the, uh, the, the one in SEM, but instead of using the electromagnetic lens, um, people use electrostatic plates. Then we also started looking at electron uh, ion beam material interaction. And we'll discuss more in details next week. If no questions, uh, let's take a small break and the lab demo will start at three o'clock will use the Helios FIB in AggieFab for the, uh, for the demo. Um, you'll see images can be formed using the ion beam. You will see like when you, you turn on the ion beam to a very large current, it can mill away materials. 
you will see one more thing. It's called CVD, uh, chemical vapor deposition. You can also use FIB to do chemical vapor deposition. Again, the working principle will cover next week in class.